message this morning was, um, you know, sometimes you try to pay attention, well, always, uh, pay attention to what the Spirit of God may be saying and what He may be doing above and beyond anything that we've prepared on Sunday morning. And I think one thing that it feels like the Lord, uh, seems like the Lord is saying through this song and through other circumstances is uh, that He is uh, the God of the impossible. Um, I don't know who in this place or who's watching online that maybe you're you're up against it, some impossible circumstances in your life, and um, I feel like the Spirit of God wants to say this morning that um, nothing is impossible with God. Amen? He has good plans. He has good intentions. He is capable, powerful, right? All, all powerful, almighty God, uh, also caring, uh, merciful, kind, and gracious to come near to us with that power and might. And so whoever in this place or maybe watching online who's dealing with something that just seems impossible, uh, the Lord wants to say to you today, uh, he is the God of the impossible. So be encouraged, put your faith in him, and he will carry you forward. Um, you know, it gets, a, it gets a little bit embarrassing, I have to admit, um, these days when I talk about uh, the days when I used to be a bricklayer. It gets a little embarrassing because 2025 will mark 20 years since I've actually picked up a trowel and laid any brick. So it's been a long time, uh, and yet there is uh, a lot of experiences that I had back in the day when I was a bricklayer that uh, stuck with me. And one of the things that stuck with me during those years was uh, the various tools that we used, um, each having its own kind of unique purpose for bricklaying. Uh, some of those tools that we used, these are called jointers. Um, it almost sounds like a joiner. When, whenever we talked about it, we said joiner. But jointer is the proper term. And you had a couple different joiners. Uh, one was a rounded, a rounded edge jointer, which would put like a rounded edge uh, to the mortar in between the bricks. And the other one was a squared, basically a square jointer. And it would square off um, the, uh, the mortar inside the bricks and uh, kind of give a different look. I don't know if you ever noticed that with brick, but now that you, you know, you see that difference, go check it out whenever you stir at brick. And is it a rounded mortar or is it squared off? And it was always kind of interesting, this thing, because it's uh, just this metal piece, kind of a metal handle with a couple wheels on it. And it literally has a nail sticking in it. That's the design. And it's still that way. And you buy them new today, and I'm like, who designed that? Probably like 75, 80 years ago, and uh, came up, and it works. And it came, and it's literally a nail that sticks through that part and uh, squares off the, the mortar. I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, then there's other parts like this. Uh, I think uh, it's called a, a tuck point. We call it a tuck point. And so sometimes whenever you had the mortar, uh, you get done laying the brick, and then there'd be little holes in the mortar where it didn't kind of all fill in, you know. Or maybe when you try to strike it with those joiners, there'd be a hole left. So you take your little tuck pointer, and uh, you would just fill in the hole and then go back and strike it again. Uh, of course, there's a trowel. The trowel became like a, an appendage. You, all day long, you had the trowel in your hand as a bricklayer, and you constantly used it. It was your main tool that you used uh, as a bricklayer. And uh, you'd use it to, of course, sling the mud and kind of, you know, uh, s um, uh, space the mud out, the, the mortar out just enough scrape it off if there was extra, and it literally just felt like, it, like a, I don't know, for those of you who play sports, like baseball, whatever, it, the basketball, that, that ball in your hand, you know, or that bat in your hand, it just kind of felt like that. It felt like a tool for the sport. You just used it all day long. Um, There's other uh, tools that, you know, were common but also unique, like this is a, called a brick hammer. It's a unique kind of hammer made for whenever you had a partial brick that you were going to use. You, you could, you could kind of really it's kind of an artwork. You would chisel the brick to the right shape. Um, you could use a big diamond blade cutter saw as well for that, but this is like a, a good little way once you got handy with it to shape the brick. And it was all these different hand tools that you would use that were just part of the, part of the job, part of the trade. But beyond that, there were also some other um, really important tools. Uh, in fact, uh, some that were really important for the brick being level, and plumb, right? So flat across and then straight up and down as well. And the, the main one that you would use for that was called a corner post. And it looks something like this. There's different versions of corner post. But, um, but once you got your corner post all set, it was so key to the, the wall end up looking, you know, like it should. And the corner post basically was, um, there's a couple different ways you could attach it. If there was no backing wall, like you were just you know, you, you, sometimes you're building brick on a building, like a, 
like a, a surface, right, um, on, a bu- on a building. Other times you're building a wall, kind of standalone wall by itself. But once you got that corner post on, it was so helpful for the brick being level, but also plumb, straight up and down. And it took a lot of the guesswork out of it once you got it set. There was a little bit of work, uh, skill to getting it set right. But once you had it set, then there was uh, these little marks you would put on it, and then uh, there would be a line, a string that would go across uh, the brick, kind of like this here. And the string would basically be your guide from the corner post. And then, I, like this here, like something doesn't look right about this picture to me as a bricklayer because he's, he's got like this much above the, the line, and look at the mortar. If he's going to go down to that line, there ain't going to be any mortar left. It's going to be brick on brick. So just, you know, observation from a former bricklayer, that doesn't look right. So uh, he's a little bit above his line, but, you know, you can, you can kind of shimmy that out as you go up if that's the case for some reason. But anyway, uh, so, but once that corner post was set and you had that line set, all you had to do to build a wall was just raise it up to the next line, uh, right? Lay that row of brick, raise it up to the next line, lay a row of brick, raise it up to the next line, and then you just kind of did that over and over again until the wall was set, or you had to raise your corner post up eventually if there was a really high wall, and uh, super, super helpful for keeping the brick level and keeping it plumb, and so you end up, you know, this is, this is a good-looking wall. Uh, whoever, did, whoever built that, they, looks like they did it right, did it well, and um, it le- looks level. I'm sure it's probably plumb, but I don't know. You can't tell from the picture, but it looks good. That's the way it should look when you have the right tools and you do it the right way. Now, sometimes you come across a brick wall where somebody thought they knew how to bri- lay brick, and they had some, you know, they had a little bit of brick, and they had some mortar, probably the wrong kind of mortar, and ended up with a wall that looks like this, right? There's somebody who doesn't know how to lay brick but thought they did, and so they went ahead and just made it work. Yeah, it's a little interesting. To say the least, interesting. But, you know, um, you know, a corner post was one of the key tools to make sure that the brick wall was laid so well, plumb and, and whatever. You know, as humans, we find that there's something really similar to a corner post that we need in our lives for our lives to be shaped well, to go well, to become a, 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 you know, a work of art. Um, we need a compass. We need a true north. We need a guide. We need something that's going to direct our steps as humans. Uh, we need a corner post. And the scriptures teach us that Jesus is our corner post. Um, we could probably put it in biblical language and say that Jesus is our cornerstone. You know, a cornerstone is, uh, served a, a similar purpose to a corner post in that it was in construction. It was um, uh, helped set the direction of the building. It was a true north. It was a guide. Uh, it was something that they could always go back to and pull off of. And right, it was that kind of that center or that most important foundational piece uh, as a building is being built. And 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 and, and Jesus functions like that in our lives. Uh, you know, life is on this planet is it, it can be tough. Uh, if you haven't figured that out yet, it can be tough. This is not the world that Adam and Eve were were created in, right? This is uh, this is not the world that we've been promised that when Jesus returns and he says, I'm going to make all things new, new heaven, new earth. This is not that world. This is a fallen world, a broken world. And um, we desperately need somebody who will... Uh, give direction to our lives to navigate this world. You know, Jesus said the, the road is wide to destruction and it's narrow to find life. And that narrow kind of picture that he creates, it's like this, right, this winding up and down. Like you need a guide to take you through that path or you're going to fall off the cliff, <laughs> right? He's like, that's, that's the kind of life it is. It's a, it's a difficult life. It's a, it can be a really good life in a really difficult world, but it's a, it's a fallen world. And he says, so we need somebody to give shape and direction to our lives. Uh, we need somebody that we can build our lives upon. We need, a, we need a corner post. Something that's going to help set the direction for everything. 
Um, you know, he gives us uh, order in a chaotic world. He brings clarity in a confusing world. He, uh, he helps bring all the, the pieces together of our life and, and make harmony, beauty out of ashes, as we sang earlier, creating works of art out of even our brokenness. It's not just a broken world, we are broken people. And he puts us together. So the key is allowing, this is the key, it's allowing his life to shape our life. Not the other way around. When we try to become the cornerstone or the corner post for our lives, uh, we make a mess. Like the guy, right, who didn't know what he was doing with the brick wall. Just shoving pieces in there. <laughs> slap some mortar on it. Hope it holds up. It won't. We need to adjust our lives to him, not the other way around. You know, sometimes we say this about the word of God, that, right, we, we cannot make the word of God adjust to our lives. We have to adjust our lives to the word. And Jesus is the living word, and so we have to, right, we have to adjust to him, and he has to be the corner post. And so we adjust our lives to him, and then things go far, far better. We end up like a beautiful beautifully crafted brick wall, whether we got rounded joints or squared off ones. Uh, so uh, today we're going to be moving forward in our study in the book of Joshua. And as we've been exploring Joshua, we are now in chapter uh, 5 in the book of Joshua. And we're going to watch a pretty powerful and strange encounter that Joshua has with a mysterious man towards the end of chapter 5. What we're going to see is that Joshua encountered God, or Yahweh, as his corner post here in chapter 5. And he had a decision to make. Am I going to adjust my life to Yahweh, or am I going to make him adjust to me? Joshua had a decision to make, and he chose well. So, um, what we're going we're gonna to see here in just a little bit is that Joshua had a very similar experience to what Moses had with God. Uh, you remember when Moses had the burning bush experience with Yahweh, and God said, I am who I am, right? I am that I am, the self-existing one. Joshua has a very similar experience with God, although it looks a little bit different. And yet, it parallels Moses' story very much. And so, we're going to take a look at that. But before we get to that kind of, if you want to call it Joshua's burning bush moment, even though it wasn't a burning bush, uh, we want to look at the earlier outworkings of chapter 5. Kind of what's going on in this chapter leading up to Joshua's kind of mysterious and strange experience with this man who shows up. Um, so the, the very early parts of Joshua chapter 5 are very encouraging. I tell you, this whole, it's almost an entire book of the Bible is very encouraging. Uh, Joshua chapter 5 and the early going, we get some really good news about this new generation who has entered the promised land. Joshua chapter 5 verse 1, we read that when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings who lived among the Mediterranean coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan River, they just crossed, right? So the people of Israel could cross. They lost heart and they were paralyzed with fear because of them. Now, this is always fascinating to me how God works in our lives. Uh, the, the people of God crossed over the Jordan River. The, the people of that land, uh, of the promised land, they were hearing about this people who crossed over this miraculous thing that happened. And it caused them to lose, right, lose their ability to want to fight, uh, right, to, to go against these people group. Like they were filled with fear, paralyzed with fear. They lost their nerve because they heard of what God did. This is fascinating to me about how God works in our lives. Uh, it's actually very encouraging. The way in which God uses moments of obedience in our lives to open up doors for us far beyond that moment of obedience. Um, so when the Israelites, they came to the Jordan River, they were faced with a challenge to trust God to do a miracle or they're going to trust themselves and their own wisdom, right? 
They chose to trust Yahweh to do the impossible, which he did. So, so this obedience, their act of faith, of, of walking in faith in God, it led them to a moment where God did the miraculous. He, right, he, he held back the waters of the Jordan. It flowed downstream, and the other waters are being held back, and they crossed over. So their act of obedience led to this opportunity to cross the Jordan, but that's not where it stopped, God's activity in their lives because they obeyed him in that moment. The, the, the work of God in their lives continued beyond that because they said, yes, in that moment, God did additional things for them that opened up new doors. Why? Because these people in the land heard of what God did because of their obedience, and now they are paralyzed with fear. So God didn't just hold back the waters to let them cross over. Now the people that are what? That are militarily uh, greater in number, they are greater in size, tactically they have the advantage, have now become weak in the knees and are afraid of fighting them. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. You know, our obedience to God has far-reaching implications for our good way beyond the initial act of obedience. You know, for example, if God calls you to uh, tell the truth about something that you've been dishonest about, the good work that he's going to do in your life will far outweigh any initial good of truth-telling in that moment. So let's just say maybe you've You've, uh, you, you told a lie or whatever, and da, 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 now you need to go back and be honest with the person, confess your sin or whatever. It kind of heals that relationship, right? And there's a mending of that relationship. But God's blessings about that obedience doesn't stop there. It will continue going forward. There will be additional things that God will then do in your life for good that go beyond the initial right act of obedience, the initial blessings or goodness of God because you obeyed in the first place. Um, maybe he's calling you to some new job or career or role or position or whatever. The good that he's going to pour into your life will go way beyond an initial, you know, new opportunity, new job, new possibility or whatever. I, I don't know how many times I, I've talked with people, and this has happened in my own life as believers, where we say, you know what, I, I'm amazed at where God has brought me over the years. Because back in 1997, forever ago, right, when I committed my life to him, I had no idea what he was going to do in my life in all these variety of ways. What he was going to, uh, how he was going to bless me, how he's going to speak into me. And it wasn't just because every act of obedience had an immediate blessing that came with it. Yes, it does. But it goes far beyond that. All these doors and, that God begins to open and possibilities begin to happen because you said yes in a moment. So when you say yes to God and you obey him, just be encouraged and know that, yeah, that thing, whatever it is that you're obeying him in, it's going to be really good and, and heal and bring whatever he wants to bring in that moment. But all these other doors are going to open. Things you have no idea about. You never dreamed of, never knew of. So trust that, and this goes back to, this goes back to uh, trusting in God over trusting ourselves, that he is so wise, that he has wisdom about how to order your life and plan your life way down the road. And if you trust him, he will bring about amazing things in your life that you can never ask or even imagine. So he does this with the people of God. He parts Right? Or he, he backs up the waters of the Jordan, but then also now their enemies are quaking in fear. Later in Joshua chapter 5, we begin to hear about these, uh, th how this is a new day for the people of God. This is a really encouraging um, picture that's being painted here in Joshua 5. That there was the old generation who disobeyed God, who didn't follow him, and because of that they they, would, they just wouldn't trust him, right? He says, I'm going to give you the promised land. And they just didn't, couldn't believe it. They couldn't trust him. They, they chose not to trust him, so they wandered for 40 years. And God is wanting to say in Joshua chapter 5, this is not that generation. This is a whole new generation. 
and this generation is following me, they're obeying me. And so he begins to paint the picture of all how this generation is not that generation. He wants to say, I want you to know, this is a whole new group, it's a whole new day, those days are behind us. So one of the ways he, he, he does this here in chapter 5 is he says, those, that generation who left Egypt, they had all been circumcised, but none of those born after the exodus, this new generation, during the years in the wilderness had been circumcised. So Joshua circumcised their sons, those who had grown up to take their father's places, for they had not been circumcised on their way to the promised land. And so basically what is being done in chapter 5 is this differentiation between the previous generation and this new generation. And he's saying, hey, I want you to know this is a whole new group. I'm not holding you accountable for the sins of your fathers. This, you, know, you don't have to follow the family tree if it's broken, right? There's, there's a better way. There's a new day. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to um, uh, the reproach of that generation has been removed, and, and now it's a new day. And he does, it, he does it further in chapter 5 because he tells them, you know how God used to take care of that old generation uh, provision for food, right? One of the things was, that he gave them was manna this stuff that fell from heaven and it was on the ground when they woke up and it tasted like honey and all these things. As they crossed over into the promised land, he makes the point here in chapter 5, the days of manna are done. I'm now going to provide for you by the crops of the land. In other words, that generation's over with. This is a new generation. There's new things that I'm doing and it's a new Day. So there's this really kind of encouraging and um, positive vibe to chapter 5 where God is saying it's a, it's a new day. A new day is dawned. A new generation. New things are happening. And let us just incur- be encouraged by that, right? We talked about this before that, that there's always a need for each new generation to put their faith in God and trust God and see Him do things. But also in, our, in all of our lives, we have these like seasons where we have to trust God fresh and new to see him new, do new things in our life. And this is a new work of God. It's exciting to see in chapter 5. And so we get to this mysterious encounter now of Joshua with a powerful military commander of some kind. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. When Joshua was near Jericho, he... He looked up, and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to the man and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? The man replied to him, Neither or neither, potato, potato, right? (laughs) Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Now, Joshua encounters a mysterious man who is of a high-ranking authority. This is a military man. He has a sword drawn, and he refuses to lower himself under the authority of either the Israelites or their enemies. He declares, I am of a higher authority, being of the commander of the army of the Lord. In essence, this mysterious man who shows up, he turns the question around on Joshua. And he says, it's not whether I'm with you or the enemy. The question is, are you with me? Are you on my side? Now, he didn't say that, but this is what he's implying. And we're going to see how it plays out. What mattered is if Joshua was on the commander of the army of the Lord's side, not the other way around. You know, later in the New Testament, Jesus made a similar declaration. He told his disciples that humans fall into two basic categories. Those who are on his side and those who are working against him. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said, if anyone is not with me, 
He didn't say, I with them. He said, if anyone is not with me, then he is against me. He who does not work with me is working against me. So Jesus also declares a, a higher authority. It matters not who, whose side Jesus is on. Boy, you can take that to the area of politics, can't you? It's not, it doesn't matter whose side Jesus is on. We can take that to the area of our own everyday lives. God, would you, I want to go do this. Will you be with me? He's like, mm, it's less about whether I'm with you, and it's more about are you with me? Jesus says, it doesn't matter. Does, it matters not whose side I am uh, who, whose side I am on, it matters who is on my side. I am the corner post. I am the cornerstone. Align yourself to me. It doesn't work the other way around if you're going to try to make me align to your plans and the what you think it needs to happen in this life. You cannot try and align Jesus' life with yours. It has to be the other way around. He has to be the higher authority. Um, there's probably a good reason why Jesus' words here in Matthew 12 parallel, by the way, this is a children's Bible, international children's Bible. I thought it was plain, so I used it. Um, there's a good reason why Jesus' words parallel that of the commander of the army of the Lord in the book of Joshua. That is because this is the same God who's showing up. You see, this mysterious man is not simply a man. He is Yahweh appearing in human form. Uh, the, the fancy theological word for this is a theophany, where God showed up in the form of a human on more than one occasion in the scriptures, uh, just like the fourth man in the fire with Daniel. Right? I see a man who looks like the son of God or sons of the God, God's son of God standing in the fire. The commander of the army of the Lord is no mere man. This is God himself appearing as a man. We see this clearly in the way that, we see it clearly, this is God in the way that Joshua responds to this commander and what the commander says to him, how he replies to Joshua. Joshua 5 and verse 14. Joshua fell face down on the ground in reverence when the commander said, neither. I am the commander of the army of the Lord. I have now come. Joshua falls face down on the ground in reverence. Other translations say in worship. And asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals. The place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So Joshua falls down and he worships this mysterious military commander, calling him Lord, which isn't always an indicator that it's God, because sometimes they refer to high-level human leaders as Lord. But there, if there's any doubt remaining about the nature of this mysterious man, it's cleared up when we hear the commander's reply to Joshua. Joshua, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. Ah. Uh, Ha. Now, our minds are meant to go back to another time where we heard almost an identical statement. Where do we hear someone say something like this before? Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. Moses. Exodus, right? And what happened in that account? So Moses is going about his day, just like Joshua, and all of a sudden he looks up and he sees a burning bush as Joshua looks up and sees a man standing in front of him with a sword drawn. And Moses looks at the bush and it's on fire, but it's not being consumed. And so he's curious, so he draws closer and he wonders what this is. And then we're told in that passage that the, the angel of the Lord shows up there in the burning bush. But then as the passage goes on, this happens in many places in the Old Testament, as the passage goes on, we learn that God is speaking to Moses 
from the bush. And so this idea of the angel of the Lord and God himself are meshed, it's like this, well, who is it? Is it the angel of the Lord or is it God or, or is it both? Is the angel of the Lord God in human form? Is the commander of the army of the Lord God in human form? The answer is yes. You see, not even an angel has the ability to make a space holy. God himself is the only one in scripture who makes a space holy. The burning bush, God said to Moses, take off your sandals, son, because you're standing on holy ground. Well, what made that dirt holy? God's presence, right? Wherever God is, the space is holy, just like the tabernacle, right? God in the tabernacle, right? The holy of holies, that inner spot is, is the hot spot of God's presence. Is there what makes it holy? God's presence does. Moses in the burning bush, God's presence made that dirt and that bush and whatever holy showing up. And now here this man who is a commander of the army of the Lord says, Joshua, take off your shoes, take off your sandals. Why? Because you're standing on holy ground. Well, what makes that space holy? God himself is standing there before Joshua in the form, in a human form, telling him, take off your shoes this is holy ground. You know, this, this experience with Joshua parallels Moses' in so many ways because Moses, God was preparing Moses at the burning bush for a great responsibility of leadership that he had. He's got to go into, into, into Egypt. He's got to lead his people out of there. He's got to oppose Pharaoh and all of his army. And, jo and God prepared Moses for that moment by showing up and saying, hey, I'm here, I'm with you, I will be with you, go and do the job, right? The most powerful being uh, in all of existence is here, I am with you, and the same thing happens with Joshua. Joshua is getting ready to lead the people of God into a tremendous amount of battles and confrontations, and God shows up in Joshua's life and says, hey, I'm here. I am with you. And Joshua, the question is not, am I on your side? As you go into this battle, the question is, are you on my side? Right? Am I up here? Am I your corner post, the way that you're going to lead going forward? Because we're going to see in the next two chapters, Jericho, they do it right. They trust God. They put him as a corner post. And then I, right, where the, the battle, where things go wrong, and they take stuff they're not supposed to take, and things go very badly. Two battles that come up. The next two chapters, God's like, this is it. This is it. Are you going to trust me? Am I going to be the one who guides you? Am I going to be the one how you determine your life? Are you going to adjust yourself to me, Joshua? Or are you going to make me try to adjust to you? Well, fortunately, Joshua gets it right. Joshua, he shows that he respects this God, surrenders himself to this God, adjusts his life, and lets God be his corner post. Joshua, he does so by asking, Lord, what do you want me to do? He humbles himself before God. He worships this God. He recognizes him. He does what he says. He takes off his sandals and follows in obedience. Then, there was a time when the same God who revealed himself to Moses and the same God who revealed himself to Joshua revealed himself to others. You know, Jesus had been betrayed into the hand of his captors, and when he revealed to them who he was, as they came to arrest him, Joshua chapter 18, or sorry, John chapter 18, Jesus is being arrested the night before his crucifixion. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. He knew he was going to be crucified and beaten and whipped and all this other stuff. So he stepped forward to meet them, those who came to arrest him. Who are you looking for? He asked. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. 
Jesus revealed himself on this occasion, but more than one occasion, that he is the same I am who appeared to Moses in the burning bush and who appeared to Joshua as the commander of the army of the Lord, and even the one who showed up in the fiery flames, uh, Daniel, in the, and, and the book of Daniel, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And that the power of that revelation, when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground because of the, what, the power of who he was saying that he was. They fell back in fear. Jesus says, I am who I am. I am. I am the self-existing one, the one who always has been and always will be. You see, your life and my life, the scripture says it's but a vapor, right? It's just a mist that disappears quickly. Here today, gone tomorrow. Who cares if God, God's life aligns with what we think is best? The challenge is, does our lives align with the great I am, who always was and always will be, the self-existing one, the self-sustaining one. You see, Jesus has the ability to be our corner post, just as Joshua encountered God as his corner post. And Joshua, he, he laid down a great model for us. And we think about what does this mean for my life and how might I apply what I'm hearing from the word of God today. Joshua acted accordingly. He humbly bowed down and worshipped this God. He submitted himself to this God's authority. He asked God, what would you have me do? And then he did it. He obeyed. I think that's a pretty good model for every one of us, huh? Bow down and worship him, submit to his authority, ask him, what would you have me do, and then do it with his help. That's a pretty good model. So as we're thinking today about our lives and how we live out our lives, what is the Lord saying to you today about your life? What's the Father speaking to you about. Here's some things that came to my mind. I think this first thing is so critical in what kind of experience we live out as believers in this life. Ask God in prayer, Father, am I asking you to align yourself to my plans in my life? Or am I aligning my life with your plans in your life? Am I just saying, God, uh, I'm, I'm driving you can ride in back, or you can ride shotgun. Just go along with me in this life, Father. Or am I saying, okay, God, you're driving. I'll ride shotgun. All right, I'll even sit in the back seat if you want me to, right? Like, whatever you want. Am I asking him to align himself with my plans? I think this is really the difference in the Christian experience for so many of us is to live a dynamic and, and, and a, you know, just a, a, a life to the full kind of experience that he has for us, I think it comes back to that question. Am I just like wanting God as my sidekick? Or am I letting him have control? Right? It makes all the difference. God bless my plans or God, what are your plans? Take me where you want. Number two. Submit anything and everything in your life to God and bring it in alignment with his plans for your life. So God, okay, whatever you have, uh, help me bring that alignment with your plans for my life. I like the, 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 the study, maybe some of you have gone through, I think many of you probably have or some of you have, called Experiencing God. Have you heard that and done that study? It's really good because the study basically asked this question or encourage you to look for, where is God at work? What's he doing? And then let me join him in what he's doing. That's basically the premise of the whole study. God, where are you at work? Let me join you in what you're doing. As opposed to, here's what I'm doing, God. Would you bless it? Right? What are you up to, God? What are you doing? Let me join you. Number three, 
follow whatever he asks for your life, whatever he asks of you, trusting that when you do, this is what we talked about earlier, blessings will come that will far outlive your initial obedience. I had no idea when I chose to follow God with my life and then follow him in the ministry that he was going to bless me with a beautiful, wonderful wife and a beautiful, you know, uh, little herd of kids, you know. I have no idea. And then all the other stuff that he's blessed me with, the wonderful churches and, and wonderful believers have been a part of, the people I've seen come to faith, I had no idea he was going to do all that stuff. It was just like, okay, God, yes, I'll take the first step of obedience. What you're asking me to do right now, I will do that. And then he opens up all of these other beautiful, wonderful experiences for us. Um, this is the way it works. He's the corner post. Are you aligning your life to him? Hey, let's stand. Let's go to our Father in prayer as we get ready to worship, as we get ready to sing. And pray. Let's talk to our Father. Father, thank you for how good you are, how kind you are. Thanks for your undying passion to draw humanity into relationship with you. This is what you created us for. This is the way life is meant to be lived. And yet, Lord, we believe you're bringing a little more clarity this morning in how it works best. Where you are supreme, you are chief, you are the great authority, you are the self-existing one who always has been and always will be, and our life is but a vapor, and so, Father, the question not is, will you bless our plans? But, Father, what are your plans? And help us to embrace those. Lord, you are the corner post who aligns our life and makes it all work in beautiful harmony. And yet, Lord, we know that we are made of dust. We are human. We are broken. And we need tremendous help to submit to your ways. We need courage. We need encouragement. We need you to hear us, uh, hear you say, I I'm with you. I'll never leave you and never forsake you. That greater is he that lives within me than he that lives in the world. And I give you my spirit as a down payment of all that's coming in this world to come. Father, we just ask for your help. Help us just to humble ourselves before you to worship you, to ask what do you want us to do, and then by your power and your grace and your tremendous help to do it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.